36 years after the original blockbuster, here we are, finally, just days away from the long-awaited and long-delayed naval aviation sequel, Top Gun Maverick. And here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are dedicating the remainder of May, and perhaps even part of June, to all things Top Gun, beginning on this episode with an exhaustive look at the storied institution the films are based on. Eh, loosely based on. Buckle up, it's Top Gun Month here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. What the hell? This is your captain speaking. Oh my god, here they go! Let's try not to get fired on the first day. Look in the air, look in the air! It'll work out. That's our talking about. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the show. I am your host, Jello, and this is episode 141, which, yeah, come to think of it, maybe should have been about the Lockheed C-141 Starlifter, but hey, it's Top Gun Month. Last week, we had a riveting discussion on the 40th anniversary of the Falkland Islands War with retired Royal Navy Commander Tim Gedge. And by all accounts, everyone seemed to enjoy that one. But this week, we get into the Top Gun spirit with a look at the Navy Fighter Weapons School itself. Now, you might be wondering which founding father or two-time instructor I cornered to help on this one. But in fact, our guest was never a Top Gun instructor. Nevertheless, he might know the fabled institution better than anyone because he spent almost a decade writing the definitive book on it. The book is called Top Gun, The Legacy, The Complete History of Top Gun and Its Impact on Tactical Aviation. It weighs in at nearly 700 pounds, and that's 700 pages for us. <laughs> and it is written by Mr. Brad Elward, who joins me now. Hello, Brad. Welcome back to the show. Hi, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Good. Well, you're no stranger to the show. Listeners may remember you were with us, I think it was about a year ago, and we were discussing another book of yours at the time. It was called Top Gun, the Navy Fighter Weapons School, 50 Years of Excellence. And during our short time together on that bonus episode, we discussed that book and a lot about Top Gun. I think we talked about debriefs and murder boards and the 50th reunion and all kinds of things. And we only hinted at the big book, which is really going to guide our discussion today. Yeah, that's right. I did the small book to come out in conjunction with the movie, and here we are with the large book. So at least I got one of them. Yeah. Well, and I've got a copy of it here with me. And if people hear thumping and jostling, it's because this thing really is a tome. And I mean that in the kindest uh, light. So we identified you last time, or I did, as an appellate attorney and a professor and all sorts of other things. But now that you're here for a full feature interview, let's start at the beginning. Brad, where are you from? Where did you go to school? And what did you do in your professional life? And as we've already identified, you were not a Top Gun instructor. In fact, you weren't even a military pilot, were you? No, I was not. That's always been something I've been trying to establish as an author is the credibility factor. And I'll back up here in a moment. But, you know, coming into the aviation writing community in the late 90s, I was not an engineer, not a pilot, obviously not former military. So I felt I had a lot of hurdles to overcome. And so what I was able to do is kind of draw on my experiences as an attorney. I'm from Washington, Illinois now. I started in East Peoria, really about the center of the state, little north of center of the state. Lived here for most of my life. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign, got my undergrad degree, and went to law school in Carbondale at Southern Illinois University. I started law practice in 1989, which seems like a long time ago for me right now. The interesting part about that is at about that same time, I had a nice interest in naval aviation that kind of started in the mid-70s with the Midway movie, if you remember when the original came out. I do. My dad took me to that and kind of developed a historical interest in me. Hmm. And so I did a lot of reading on the side. So even though I became a lawyer, I kind of had a passion on the side for military uh, history and naval aviation in particular. And in my early years as a lawyer, of course, we had the Gulf War. That kind of sparked my interest in trying to find some way to have a connection with naval aviation. So I uh, continued on in my career as an attorney. Uh, I was an appellate attorney, as you mentioned earlier. And it's an interesting part of being a lawyer. I know a lot of times we watch TV and we see attorneys 
handling trials and doing depositions and things of that nature. I did some trials. I did a, quite a few depositions. But my focus was to take the case after the trial was over, after the work in the trial court concluded, maybe a motion to dismiss and the case was thrown out. We'd end up in the appellate court where we would write extensively. We'd write briefs for the court and then we'd argue those. And we'd end up in the appellate court and the Supreme Court. And over the course of my 30 years, I ended up writing a lot. It was that writing experience and that approach to taking something that was completely foreign to you, somebody else's trial, and turning that into your own appeal. And so as I started you know, to become a military aviation rider, I borrowed a lot of those skills. And you know, it really involved planning out in a logical way what you were trying to do, uh, getting used to interviewing people, trying to figure out what the real issues were, asking questions and leading to different types of answers that you could continue on to find what you really wanted to accomplish with the article. And so that helped me a lot kind of cross over into the military writing position. So I was able to draw on that a lot. I know a few of the people I interviewed for this book would joke with me. Yeah, I can tell you're a lawyer. I feel like I just got done with the deposition. And I said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you feel that way. <laughs> but it really did come in handy. And the kind of the funny little side story about that is that almost all of my interviews I had transcribed into a little booklet format. So that if you are familiar with having a deposition taken and got the opportunity to read it in a booklet format afterwards, I've got those for almost all of my interviews that I did for this book. It really does have a lot of overlap between what I did as a lawyer and what I did to put this book and other projects of mine together. I had a lot of fun as a lawyer. I retired in 2019, and I've been just doing some writing uh, since that time, and I've been teaching at a couple universities, communications, and a law class. So I'm trying to uh, redirect my writing into some different points and different areas, and it's been a lot of fun. Well, I want to use this book as sort of our guide today, Brad. Really what I want the subject to be about is the Navy Fighter Weapons School, and that's why I invited you, because you really did spend a ton of time and energy on this project, and you, although you didn't live it, you probably see it from a different perspective. So I just thought we could use the book as our guide and kind of follow the chronology that the book follows as we talk about the school and some of the beginning. I expect this might take a little while. I hope you have plenty of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's start at the beginning, though, with the actual book. For those who have it, there's an element of it that's in the book. But tell all the listeners, what was the inspiration for writing it? Because before this, you'd written a gigantic book. I don't even have it, but I've seen it. The FA-18, I think, what, Hornet, Super Hornet, and Growler, uh, as well as, did you do the S3 book? And you've done a lot of other books, but you can correct me on all those in a second, but then lead into what the inspiration was for this one. This book was my uh, 14th book. I had a couple books that I worked on chapters with other people on. So it was my 12th book that was actually all mine. I started writing the books in roughly 1999. My first came out in 2000. It was on the A4 Skyhawk. Mm. It was a result of working with some people who opened some doors for me. Over the years, I started focusing on two aircraft, the Viking, as you mentioned, and the Hornet program, which encompasses the A through D as well as Growler and Super Hornet. I have a smaller book that talks about the Hornet and then more of a photo book that's on the Hornet in the Navy and the Marine Corps. And then I've got my large Super Hornet Growler book. It was in the course of working on the Super Hornet book when I was visiting Fallon that the whole idea for the Top Gun book came. It wasn't really my idea. It was actually one of the former commanding officers, Paul Olin, who gave me the idea. I had done a portion of a couple books for Osprey on F-4 MiG killers of Vietnam back around 2001, 2002. And I had met a few of the Top Gun founders and some various people who had been at the school over the course of its career. And so I knew some people. I knew a little bit about it. Obviously, I'd seen the movie, Red Scream of Eagles, which is still a fantastic read. I recommend for everybody. But I had never really given some thought to doing the big book on it myself. And so I'm out at Top Gun. I'm, I'm in the skipper's office, and we're talking about the school. And we kind of got on a little sidetrack, and we started talking about the founding. And he says, you know, I've met several of the founders recently. We did an event that I was at on the 40th anniversary. And he said, what a great group of people. 
And I said, yeah, I said, I met a couple, I've read Scream. And he said, well, you know, nobody's really brought that book forward. And I said, yeah, you're right. I'm kind of surprised in all these years that the topic has pretty much been left at the founding. And he said, you ought to write that. <laughs> and I kind of laughed. I started thinking about it later in my hotel room. I thought that would be kind of interesting. I got a hold of Daryl Gary, who I had met, and through him, Dan Pedersen. And I asked him, I said, you know, how would you guys feel about participating in a sequel and helping me establish, you know, the footprint to bring that forward? And they were both real excited about the idea. And both of them had said, yeah, we'll provide all the resources that we can provide. This was around mid-summer of 2009. So I still had a lot of work to do on Super Hornet. So I started playing around with the idea of thinking about what it would look like. I talked to a few people here and there, but I made the commitment to get the Super Hornet book done. And then I told my wife I'd take a year off because I had really <laughs> devoted a lot of time to Super Hornet. So I did. I kind of played around with it at night. Finally, about 2011, a little before that is when I really started sketching out what would this thing look like and what do I need to do to get it done? I got to admit, you know, you mentioned the book, 700 pages. I never envisioned it to be of that size. Matter of fact, when I pitched it, I pitched it as about a 350 page book. And I figured maybe in its largest growth, it would probably be about the size of the Super Hornet book, about 450. I had no idea it would end up as large as it did. Now, I take my hat off to my editor at Schiffer for that because he gave me the discretion to really run with it. I think I called him about 2015. I said, Bob, this thing's going to be quite a tome. And I said, um, I think it's going to be worth it if we can run with this. And he said, yeah, do whatever you need to do. Take whatever time you need. We'll just make it work when that happens. And so I really appreciate that. A lot of publishers would not have been that generous. And he was. So anyway, you know, about 2011 is when I really started refocusing myself on this. And I started reading about everything I could get my hands on. All the various books that are out there, I started trying to get some reports from various sources, official reports. And I started making contact with people at the Top Gun School that, as it existed at the time. That was really the real steamrolling moment where I really started to pick up. And in about 2014, when we hit the 45th anniversary, I really started to get massive Top Gun School support. And that's about the time that you and I met when I was mm -hmm. out on one of my trips. It really, at that point, it became a document control situation because my <laughs> Interviews by then were growing. I was doing sometimes three or four a day, multiple days a week. That was quite a task to get all them organized. I really, honestly, I took notes of who they were. I put them in a time frame as far as what year they took place and who they might know for further reference. And then I kind of stuck them in a pile until the time came to start putting it together. But by about 2015, I felt like I had enough information where I was starting to see a circle back. You know, one of the things about being a lawyer is, you know, you always ask yourself, how much do I research something before I think I really know what the answer is? And usually we say when you start to see the same result from your research over and over, you probably got it fairly thorough. And I was starting to see the same stories, the same events. And at that point, I thought, OK, I probably feel safe enough to start moving into a writing phase. I'll keep working on this as I go. And so in the January of 16 is when I started writing the book. And, you know, I know we'll talk about it later, but I started with the early days of combat, air combat tactics, air combat tactics training. And that took me a lot longer to write than I thought. I thought I knew that subject well, but I really, in my research, needed to dig deep and ended up probably buying another 200 books for my collection <laughs> to help build that knowledge base. And it took probably uh, up until about 2019 where I was really ready to start writing about the school. I'd started on that, the 60s, uh, what happened in Vietnam, all of that, which is quite extensive in the history of Top Gun. That probably took me most of 18, early 19, and I was actually starting to talk about the 70s. Now, that doesn't mean by that point I had not interviewed people, because as I said, you and I talked. Mm -hmm. You know, my interviews were kind of funny over the years because I might have a 10 o'clock interview with somebody from 2013, and my 12 o'clock would be with somebody from 1972, and then my night interview would be with the skipper from 82. And so I was constantly jumping all over the place as I would do my interviews. So I felt like I had pretty good roadmap 
And I know we mentioned the 2019 50th anniversary reunion in our talk on my small book, but that was a really uh, reaffirming moment for me because one of the nice parts of working with Top Gun is that they allowed me to come out and visit the school. And I made nine trips to Top Gun out at Fallon. I visited several of the weapons schools and some other locations too. But obviously, you know, you're going to write a book on Top Gun, you better go to Top Gun. Mm -hmm. And several of my trips were three and four day trips at a time. I got to do some really fun stuff like watch the graduation event, uh, watch the graduation uh, take place of one of the classes. I got to be there when the founders came back and did a presentation in 2014. I went to one of Willie Driscoll's presentations, which was really enlightening. Got to talk with him quite a bit. I went to the reunion on the 45th, and I got to sit through a murder board. I had a mock briefing and debriefing given to me by members of the staff, which was a lot of fun. Obviously, they didn't talk about anything classified. It was all a declassified presentation. But it was still extremely helpful to putting the whole process together. But the culmination of that was the invitation in 2019 to come to the reunion and to find out that not only was I going to get to come and have dinner with everybody and meet some of these people I had only met on a phone call, because we weren't using Zoom then, we were doing telephone calls. A few of them were in person, obviously, Mm -hmm. but a lot of them were done on the phone. So I'm thinking, well, this is going to be great. I get to go meet a lot of these people and, and meet some of these legends in person. Well, then the invitation got extended. We are going to have a event on the Friday of the weekend ceremonies. And we're going to have all the instructors that can attend back. And we're going to do a panel presentation covering the decades of Top Gun. And you, Brad, get to sit in on that. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be great. So I started thinking about that. And I thought, my gosh, what if I get out there and I find out that I've missed 50% of the information? So I started to get a little bit worried. And as the day came about and went through, what I found out was quite the opposite. Other than people sharing personal stories about when they and a friend went and did something funny and were kind of adding some color to the discussions, I probably got 95% of what had happened. And I felt really complete after having witnessed that. And it was really neat. I know you there, but you're, you know, to put your listeners in that event. You know, they had two instructors from each decade. They tried to get people who didn't really have an overlap so that they could highlight the significant events that took place at Top Gun during their tenure. And so most of the decades had pretty complete coverage from start to finish. And so I thought that was a really good validation for the work that I had done up to 2019. So that event to me was really an eye opener. It was really comforting and it gave me a lot of confidence to kind of push forward that I was on the track and really going to make something that all of you would look at and be hopefully pleased with. So that was a big event. I wrapped up the writing in 2020. I think it was May of 2020 and the rest of the project was just you know waiting for the drafts to come and edit and edit. You know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was my background lacking any military experience, any time as a pilot. I had to really focus on credibility. And when I went about this project, to me, that was one of the biggest issues that I faced is who's going to listen to you? What I tried to do is to tell the story through the voice of all of those who attended the school, taught at the school, who commanded the school. And so one thing that you're going to find in this is a lot of personal comments and stories by the instructors, the graduates, the skippers, people who worked with and around Top Gun, who may have been, a when the school was founded, perhaps somebody who commanded out at Miramar and was offering observations of what was happening at the school. So I tried to do that through all these interviews, and I ended up with about 450. Wow. That's a lot, you know, of people to talk to. <laughs> and the other thing I tried to do is I tried to make sure that every time I heard a story, I validated it by at least one or two other people. Or I validated it with a document. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really surprised me about the Top Gun story is the lack of documentation that's out there. Apparently, when Top Gun made its move in 96 from Miramar to Fallon, the documents were all boxed up that they kept in their vault. And not all of them ended up at Fallon. And nobody seems to know where they went. 
We checked the National Archives. We checked the Historical Center. We checked other Navy archives. I had numerous intel officers at Top Gun go into the vault and to inventory for certain things that I was looking for, and none of them could be found. And so trying to find independent documentation at a non-classified level that I could draw upon to fill in gaps and to confirm was a really tall order. I ended up with quite a bit of documentation but not nearly the documentation that I thought. Some of the command histories were five pages long. Some of them were 50 pages long. It was just really hard to piece everything together. I found I had to rely on a lot more individuals. And that kind of leads to another part of the book, you know, the writing process I thought was interesting is as I really started to get into the story of Top Gun, I had to ask myself, how are you going to tell this? Whose perspective am I going to use There isn't anybody who has a real grip on the 50 years of Top Gun, maybe Willie Driscoll. But aside from him, there was not an individual who has had real definitive contact with Top Gun as an entity over the course of his entire 50 years. And so I couldn't tell the story from any individual's perspective. And I certainly couldn't do it chronological because I found I would be doing too much repeating. Hmm. So I thought, well, what if I tell the story from the perspective of the school and how it evolved? and how it grew and the issues it faced, and just tell that through the voice of the people who were there. And that's what I ultimately ended up doing. I tried to use the instructors, skippers, et cetera, the real documents, official reports, to build the credibility that I didn't have because I wasn't there, wasn't in contact with the school really at all other than my nine visits. It was a fun process. It took a lot longer than I ever, ever anticipated. I never even really dreamed when I started I didn't even think about the 50th anniversary coming up. And I know there were some people that were pushing me to try to get it done for the 50th. And I thought, unless I quit my job, <laughs> there's absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to devote the time yeah. that was you know, needed to this. And one of the things that surprised me with this school is the importance of the 1990s. And I know, you know we're going to walk through that later today. But the 90s chapter took me longer than any chapter in the book <laughs> to research and write. It took me from July of 2019 until January of 2020 to write that chapter. Wow. And it's the longest chapter in the book. And so when we get to that, I'll share some of the reasons why. But it was fascinating. There were many instances during that research where I literally assembled a chain of people, of Stanos, standardization officer who followed each other, a whole line of training officers who followed each other so that I could get the message passing from what happened when you were there, how did you leave it, how did you find it, what did you do, and how did you leave it, and continue that story. And so I really worked hard to do that in the early part of the 90s to tell all the stories. And that was fun. It was really difficult because sometimes I would write something and I would send it out to 25 people, and then I would just watch them go back and forth in emails. No, you're not right. This isn't right. We need to do this. No, you're wrong. (laughs) It was a hilarious (laughs) comparison to watch everybody kind of go back and forth and until we got the story that everybody was comfortable with. Well, Brad, I want to definitely get into Top Gun itself, but one more question on the background and everything that you went through, and thank you for that in-depth explanation. Have you seen Dorf since, and that's Paul Olin, he and I were on the staff his first time. Have you seen him since? And if you have, did you hug him or punch him? I have not seen him in person. I have talked to him. I thanked him when I sent him a copy of the book. I thanked him for the wonderful idea and the confidence. He was a big help. He offered a lot of support at various moments when he had contact with the school. Yeah. And, you know, a funny side story is a lot of people probably not be aware, but in 2013, in November, Washington, Illinois, where I lived at the time, was hit by tornado. That morning, I had an interview with Paul, one of the many interviews that we did. It was really a funky morning. It looked weird. It was warm. We kept hearing this weird noise in the air. I kept thinking, something's not right, but whatever. And so I call Paul. I just started my call, and I said, you know, there's tornado warnings out. It's probably just we get them all the time. No big deal. Not to worry. So let's go ahead and do the interview. Are you sure? That sounds serious. I said, don't worry about it. (laughs) Well, then the sirens went off, and I said, Sirens are going off. That's kind of interesting. He goes, yeah, I can hear him. He said, are you sure you don't need to go? I said, no, we're fine. So we start the interview. Next thing I know, my wife comes running around the corner into my den with a panic look on her face, and she's pointing out the front door. She goes, it's out front. It's out front. And I said, Paul, I've got to go. 
And so I clicked the phone, ran, looked out the window, and there was the F5, F4 tornado, Oof. whatever it was. It was big, right out our front door. I head downstairs, and Paul, meantime, makes some comment to his wife, like, I think this guy might be going through a tornado. And so they turn on the Weather Channel, and sure enough, they're getting reports <laughs> that Washington, Illinois is hit by a major tornado. And he's thinking that my phone's dead. I can't get Brad. I think he may, is he alive? <laughs> so it was kind of a funny little twist and oh it took us a couple of days to connect after that. Yeah. I would assume so. Did yeah. your house do okay? We did. Okay. The rest of our subdivision did not. Oh gosh. Well, earlier in your description of all that, I was making mental notes of certain things I could maybe address, but I don't know that we want to go back through all of that. The one thing, though, you did say something about the length and that your publisher was very generous. To be fair, right? I know a book always includes everything, but the writing stops at about 510 pages, and then you've got almost 200 pages of appendices and the index and everything else. So, but even so, it is an amazing book. And I have to admit to you, Brad, it sat on my desk when you sent it to me. Thanks very much. And it was intimidating. And so I thought, man, I'd like to read this, but I don't know if I can. And then once you and I agreed to do this interview, I thought, well, I better crack it open. And sure enough, I found myself just completely uh, engrossed in it. And I wished I'd have started it sooner because there was no way I was going to finish it before today. But it really is a great book. And again, it's going to kind of guide our discussion here with the caveat now that we've spent the last roughly half hour describing. Let's just get right into it. Now, right away on the inside cover, you have a comment here, and I don't know if this is your writing. It doesn't quote anyone else, so I assume it's you. It says, the history of air combat has seen one recurring theme. New tactics are learned in battle, forgotten or discarded when battle concludes, and relearned at great cost during the next war. That really does set the tone for this book, doesn't it? Because as you look at the first couple chapters and the first phase of your book, as we'll describe it, when air combat began in, let's call it World War I, I think there were some guys shooting pistols at each other in the Mexican-Spanish War or something. But in World War I, they had to figure things out, and it was brand new. And then after the war, a lot of it didn't get held, and that seemed to be a theme that ultimately led to some of the challenges that even the moviegoers know from the 1986 film when you just first start watching it and you've got the Harold Faltermeyer little sound in the background and everybody gets all excited. But the first thing you do is read and it talks about the school and why it got started. But let's start at the beginning. What kind of led up to a need for something that ultimately later became Top Gun? What I wanted to accomplish, and I think this will lead to the question that you just presented, a lot of the books on Top Gun, in a very summary manner, will say one of the founding principles was to break the cycle, as you mentioned, of learning, forgetting, and relearning. And the first portion of this book, the beginning, was my kind of expanded way to actually show the people that history. It's important for Top Gun because what had happened after each of the major wars that took place, World War I, World War II, and, and even Korea, is we have this body of knowledge, body of tactics that had been developed, that had been disseminated to the fleet, we'll limit it to the Navy, and applied successfully, and then the conflict ends. And then for a variety of reasons, the information that had been gained was lost. It was forgotten, or it was discarded. That happened after World War I, in part due to the downsizing. Everybody thought that was the great war to end all wars. We're not going to have this type of stuff happen again. There was a massive change in the size of the military, the Navy, naval aviation. There were theories that were back and forth about the purpose of air combat. Do we rely solely on the bombers? What's the role of fighters? In the Navy, we had the role of the battleship versus the role of the aircraft carrier as the carrier there to support the battleship. There were a lot of distractions that took place. There were technological issues. But for one reason or another, the lessons that were learned after, say, World War I were kind of forgotten. The same thing happened after World War II. And you would think within just five years between World War II and Korea that that would not have probably happened, but it did. And even after the Korean War, we saw the same type of thing happening. So when we went into the 1960s, and we had a naval aviation community that found itself without a lot of historical understanding of where it came from, 
There certainly wasn't a lot of standardization, standardization in training or tactics. There, surprisingly, was no real official Navy manual on air combat tactics that existed in the 1950s or the 1960s. At first, I thought it was just my deficiency as a researcher. But after interviewing numerous people who were pilots in the 50s and 60s, they would say, no, we really didn't have anything. We used the Air Force. We used Boots Blessy. We used John Boyd's material, but that's all we had. So you had a Navy that didn't really have a standardized air combat training methodology. And on top of all of that, you had the introduction of the high-speed interceptor and the air-to-air missile and the focus on intercepting the bomber before it could launch its missile against the carrier battle group. So the notion of air combat tactics really had kind of fallen by the wayside. I mean, the F-8 community obviously still had that mindset. But the F-4 community in the 1960s was thinking intercept, launch, speed out to the target, launch our missile, down the bomber, and turn around and go home. And they really didn't train in air combat tactics. For a while, it was heavily frowned upon because we had these expensive airplanes. The missiles that were developed were developed in a non-maneuvering type environment. They were intended to shoot down a bomber flying straight and level and relatively slow compared to a fighter. Mm -hmm. You had the lack of training, the lack of appreciation of the need for the dogfight. You had certainly a lack of standardization. You had a situation where a lot of the people who did have personal knowledge of air combat tactics were either maybe not a good instructor. Just because you know something real well doesn't mean that you can teach it well. But then you also had a lot of people who knew the subject real well, but figured, hey, I had to learn it the hard way. You have to learn it the hard way, too. And I had that repeated to me by numerous people, even in the F-8 community. We had a lot of guys that were extremely experienced, but they felt you had to earn it. And they weren't going to share it. And they weren't going to reduce their stature. You had to win it. And so they were very stingy about what they shared with the rest of the squadrons. So if you had a squadron with a really good air combat tactic mentality and the guy was willing to share it with you, they were a fairly proficient air combat squadron. But if you didn't, it was quite the opposite. And so when we went into the Vietnam War, that was kind of the mindset that was going on in naval aviation. It's very sporadic knowledge in the F-4 community, depending on what squadron you were in, who was in charge of it, what their background was. When the air war started, certainly we weren't fighting Soviet bombers. We were fighting very nimble MiGs. The MiG-17 in particular at first, it ended up being quite a challenge for a group of individuals that were trained an intercept with a missile that was really not intended for a highly maneuvering target, where many of the pilots had never fired a missile before they had gone to Vietnam. And so deficiencies started to show up in the air combat kill ratio, number of airplanes we shot down versus the number of planes of ours shot down. And on a historical comparison, they were quite low. It depends on what combat you want to look at, whether it's World War II or Korea, but they floated around 10 to 1. Mm-hmm the Air Force for the Navy, different aircraft had higher, et cetera. But the kill ratio that we saw by the end of Rolling Thunder in roughly 68 was putting the Navy at about 2.4 to 1. And the Air Force was a little lower. Everybody was starting to say, well, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And that was really the genesis of the ALT report, which most people who are familiar with Top Gun are familiar with the ALT report, did that significant study where they analyzed all the air-to-air engagements and tried to draw some conclusions. And one of the conclusions, in addition to faulty missiles and faulty firing of the missiles outside their envelope, et cetera, was a lack of a high level of air combat training. You know, the Navy had had a program in the 1950s, the Fleet Air Gunnery Unit, FEGU. It operated on the West Coast from 52 to 60. That was eventually shut down because a lot of the mentality was, well, we've got missiles, we don't need to be proficient in air-to-air gunnery. And so that went away. But it was noted in the ALT report that that had produced a significant deficiency, in particular in the F-4 community in air-to-air combat skills. And so they were advocating a return to that type of program, which is where the, you know, the whole notion of Top Gun then came from, the F-4 Navy Fighter Weapons School. Yeah. And so to your point, right, the CNO, I believe, said, all right, something's not right here. Our kill record is historically low. We're not being effective or efficient. And so we've got to do something about this. So they found Captain Frank Alt. They said, all right, 
you got the dot. It's up to you to go figure this out. And he gave a big report. I forget how many hundreds of pages, but essentially, if I understand correctly, one of the chapters in there was a discussion of, hey, we need to do better with training. So we recommend right away, or I, in this case, him speaking, that we uh, create an institution to work on this because like you said, it had gone away. But they didn't stand it up from the beginning. They sort of said we should do it as part of the fleet replacement squadron. So I think maybe they called it the RAG back then, but same thing. So they took the F-14, or actually the F-4, I think it was, squadron, and said, all right, you guys are in charge of this. Absolutely. The formation of Top Gun is an interesting story. There's a lot of different variations that go out about maybe when it started. But you're correct. It didn't start as a standalone school. It started as a department within the F-4 RAG on the West Coast, and it was a VF-121. So the interesting thing to me is that a lot of people associate Top Gun with having started in January of 1969 with the Alt Report's official publication. But the school actually got started in late September of 1968. The background on that is kind of interesting because when I talked to the people that were at Miramar in the late 60s, they're all we knew we needed an advanced weapons school. Everybody was talking about that. And the guys that were coming back from Vietnam with war experience were saying we needed to go back in that direction. It was kind of an understood moment at Miramar that, yeah, we need to go in that direction. But when Frank Alt would do his research, he would include these symposiums and he would bring in the fighter community. He'd bring in VX4 and they'd have these symposiums at Point Magoo and at Miramar where they would talk about what's going on, what are the problems, what do you think we should do to resolve this? And so everyone was starting to really understand we're going in this direction. I think some point in September, an unofficial draft of at least that portion of the alt report was circulated. That's when the air wing that had under it BF-121 and the F-8 counterpart, BF-124, he got the skippers of those two squadrons together and said, look, this is coming. We need to get on top of this. Start working on this. That's when the individual skippers went to the respective people, Dan Pedersen included, and started the idea, we need to form this, get this rolling. And so Dan Pedersen started this in late September of 1968. And of course, it picked up massive steam in 69, January, when the official report came out. So the idea was, we need to create a program that's going to teach advanced air combat tactics in a way that we not only can revisit the lessons that we had learned and lost, but that we can anticipate tomorrow's threat and get that information together embedded in a couple of individuals, your F-4 crew, and send them back to the fleet squadrons they came from and have them serve as training officer, per se, Mm. in the individual squadrons to spread that message. And so that's the formula that they came up with to start the school and that it operated with for the first roughly 25 years. And we all just use 1969 as kind of the birthday, especially for our 50th, which was in 2019, because that was when they graduated the first class. And so there's a lot of great literature out there. We don't necessarily need to cover it today about some of the heroics, I guess is a good way to put it, for the young guys there who got these orders and marched forward with them in such a way that it really did create a lasting legacy. And I love that you titled your book, The Legacy, because I think that's a great way to put it. Because had they come at this, right? And we've all done, at least I have, and my kids certainly do. Oh, I don't want to do that, but okay, you know, and do it like just bare minimum kind of thing. Who knows what the rest of the Vietnam War in the last 50 years of naval aviation would have been like. But instead, they came at it with this vigor and can do, and it's going to be the best, and we're going to have this high standard. And, you know, they went and bartered and borrowed, shall we say, different equipment that they needed, including the trailer to set up in. And they painted up a sign to put on it. And then they designed the Top Gun patch that we all know and love on a cocktail napkin. I mean, they really came at it with some fervor and laid a foundation that persists today because anyone who goes to Top Gun sees that in the academics, in the flying, in the discipline really all through. And so I think those founding fathers really are owed a big debt of gratitude. And even in your book, in some of the opening introductions, like Pops says, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think those guys definitely deserve that title. I would agree with you. Absolutely. I think from discussing this with them, and I interviewed several of the founders individually, I had a couple occasions where I was privileged to interview a group of them. (laughs) I probably spent, I don't know, 30 hours, maybe a little more, 
with those groups over the multiple interviews that I did. There were a couple of things I think that drove that attitude that you're talking about, which has really formed the backbone of Top Gun. And one was they understood that they were a group of lieutenants with the lieutenant commander in charge. And they were worried about credibility. And they were worried about somebody saying, well, who are you to tell me this? Mm -hmm. And so they started researching every point that they were responsible for as deep as it possibly could. And you had people like Mel Holmes and Jim Rulison who would go out and interview people. Jim Rulison, in fact, would go to Raytheon, you know, go to Hughes, and would walk the manufacturing floor and understand how the missiles were put together. They would go up to uh, you know, China Lake and Point Magoo, and they would talk to everybody involved in the chain in order to get the detailed knowledge that they had. What that did is it instilled in the school this quest to master, to become the subject matter expert, which is now the hallmark of the Top Gun instructor staff. And that is what drives the whole murder board process to be assigned a topic as an incoming instructor, to research that independently as far as it can possibly go, and then to hone that into your presentation, which becomes your class lecture, and then your discussion point with anybody within the Navy or Marine Corps who has a question about your subject matter area. That all is traceable to the founders. That's right. That was one of the things that drove them. The other thing I got from talking with them is they had a massive quest to make sure that their friends weren't going to die anymore. I asked when I had a group of them together the first time we were talking, I said, did you guys realize the significance of what you were doing? And did you realize that you were starting a program that would have its own life? Every one of them said no. We had no idea. And one of them says, we were just trying to make sure that our friends who were going back to Southeast Asia weren't going to die for the wrong reasons. They said, we thought we knew what some of the answers should be, and we needed to be able to document it and be a credible source for that. And I thought, wow, what an interesting response. Yeah. What a humble response from yeah. these guys. And they really are larger than life. What they did, some of it was inadvertent. Some of it was done for other reasons, all of which were good. But it ended up producing a culture of excellence that permeates school for the entire history. Oh, absolutely. Brad, I am in no way anywhere near your league of writing, but I do dabble because I enjoy it. So on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com, I had previously released two articles and I'm repurposing them for Top Gun Month here in uh, May of 22. One is what you just talked about as far as the murder board stuff, how to present like a Top Gun instructor, I call it. And the other one is the Top Gun lore. And I wrote that one after that 2019 reunion because I was just at the time, having not read your book, we had talked, but I didn't know what your conclusions would be. And, and I was thinking about it and I came up with some of the things you just talked about. I mean, the school was forged in fire, if you will, right? There was failure happening. People, their friends were dying. And so it wasn't just this think tank idea. It was, hey, we really need to solve this. Another uh, headline of my article, if you will, or the section of it is it was run by the uh, Indians, not the chiefs, right? So they weren't so senior. They had to worry about protecting their careers. <laughs> they were the underdog. They had to struggle for resources all the way through. Even when I was back there in 13 to 15, we were still trying to get enough range space and aircraft and flight hours. And then the, the murder board and, and results. And you know, right away, they sent folks back from some of those early classes, you talk about it in the book, of course, but right away, folks went back and started uh, racking up kills. And, and that became sort of a hallmark of the hangar at Miramar as they would start painting the silhouettes and putting the pilots' names and the uh, dates. So it really worked right away, didn't it? It really did. And one thing that you mentioned about the group of lieutenants, I think it's important because it goes to the Top Gun culture is they really developed an atmosphere. And I think this was something that Pedersen pushed, but it was an atmosphere of we're all in this room and we're going to talk about this and no one is going to have any predisposition based upon your rank or what you've done. You just have to validate your point based on rational thought and reason. <laughs> and that's become a trademark of Top Gun today, even with the standardization board yep. and the murder board process is, is whether you're a lieutenant, lieutenant commander, commander, or maybe somebody who's visiting for a murder board, who's from NSOC, who's an admiral or whatever, it's a rankless discussion. When you go in that room and have a discussion, 
your biggest obstacle is overcoming the rationale of what it is that you're saying. You've got to be able to back it up. And if you can, that can carry the day. And mm-hmm. I think that started with this original group and in the way they approached things. So yeah, I, I think that's a really valid point to make about the whole Top Gun group. To your other point though, Top Gun started sending classes back to the fleet in 69. They had six or seven classes the first year. It was in March of 1970 that they had the first Top Gun student involved in a MIG kill. And that was uh, the end of March of 1970. And I know that was a big event for the school. I think somebody was even saying that we heard there was a MIG shoot down. Wouldn't it be great if it were one of us, one of our people? And sure enough, it was. It was a member from the very first class. That was a big deal. But one of the things that caused a little bit of anguish, though, is you remember when Rolling Thunder ran from 65 to 68, there was a stand down from 68 until uh, roughly 72 when linebackers started. And so there was not a lot of air activity up north. And so the opportunity for the many, many Top Gun graduates who were back in the fleet by now to engage in an air combat scenario was very small. And so there was a lot of consternation about that fact. It's like, well, we've got one validation, but Are we ever going to really be active up north again? And so when the linebacker campaign started is when the real validation came. When we had the roughly 24 kills that took place, ended up with a 12 and a half to one kill ratio. 1972, with the final kill in January of 73, was really the massive validation for Top Gun of what we're teaching worked. And this is the way forward. I think that was the validation that honestly really kept the school going because many of the people that I talked to from that era had made the comment to me, gosh, up to 72, we felt like we were making a difference. We heard from people we were making a difference and we had one MIG kill that was a validation of that. But we were really worried that if the war ended, that people might not see the large value of what we're doing and we might end up going the way of the fleet air gunnery unit. So there was some concern about that. After 72, there was no concern. (laughs) They knew they were on the map and they were going to stay. And it was in mid-72 when Top Gun then became its own standalone command in July. That really sealed the school's fate going forward. Well, but that didn't mean all the problems or obstacles went away, as we'll talk about as we start going through the decades. Now, before we start with the 70s, though, Brad, there's a couple things I want to ask you about at the founding. And again, it's all in your book and other books. But just for the sake of the audience, two things, and I can ask the second one after if you want. But one is the Air Force already had a weapons school as early as in the 50s, if I understand but didn't quite have the same results. So I'm wondering if you can draw any parallels between the two. And even to this day, the Air Force Weapons School and Top Gun, while they will share graduates and do exchange tours, it's really different. I mean, one is kind of short and condensed, that being the Navy's, and the other is more building strategic leaders and lasts for half the year, and that's the Air Force. So I want to ask you about that. And then I also want to ask you, and again, I'll remind you if you forget, but on this show even, I've been... It's been suggested to me, I'll say, that the Brits somehow had a hand in forming Top Gun. And I never knew enough about it until I started skimming through your book. Like I said, I didn't have time to read the whole thing, but I did see that part. And there was a particular article that you address and you kind of put it to bed in your book. So I thought we could talk about those two things. But let's start with the Air Force and their weapons school and how it either made a difference or didn't to the Navy when they went to stand up in late 68. That's a fantastic point because I ask myself several times when I was doing this research, if the Air Force had a fighter weapons school from roughly 52 to 54, I think somewhere in there is when the official school really started. They had it for quite a while before the Vietnam War. Why weren't they achieving better results? I did quite a bit of investigating on that. And I think what it really came down to is that the people who were above the fighter weapons school in the Air Force came from two different thought patterns. One was the age of the dogfight is over. And the other was, well, any next war we have is going to be nuclear. And they stress the strategic aspects. In fact, if you looked at a lot of the fighters of the 50s and 60s in the Air Force, they were really designed as interceptors to shoot down Soviet bombers. Mm -hmm. They weren't as much in the spirit of the famous fighters from the Korean War and World War II that the Air Force fielded. So you had a mindset that was kind of above the fighter weapons school in the Air Force. 
that was kind of putting a thumb on them. There's a couple points in the book where a few of the instructors from the fighter weapons school were talking about either their exposure to the Top Gun in the early days or some of the Air Force studies that were out there that was advocating to move away from the finger four maneuver to move into a, a loose deuce type tactics that the Navy used and the F-8 community used as well. And the fighter weapons school individuals, the instructors were rather receptive to some of this. And they were wanting to make those recommendations, but those were quashed by people outside of the weapons school who were higher in the TAC air community. And so a lot of what Top Gun was allowed to do by the uh, Navy brass, for lack of a better word, in 68, 69, 70, the fighter weapons school of the Air Force was not allowed to do. It was a much more rigid control. When I talked to several of the Top Gun founders, they would constantly praise the command elements at Miramar for not getting in their way. <laughs> and they really were that blunt. They told us this is what we need to do. Unfortunately, didn't give us a lot of assets to do it, but didn't get in our way either. And most of the approval was pretty much, well, you're comfortable with it. Let's go with it. Those individuals, I think, were extremely important in allowing Top Gun to become the, I want to say independent, but the independent thought community that it was of the time. The Air Force did not enjoy that. And I think that's one of the biggest differences between the two communities throughout the Rolling Thunder and, more importantly, throughout the linebacker. Because the Air Force, after Rolling Thunder, looked at themselves and said, well, our training's fine. It's probably some of our weapons and our control. So they tweaked their air controlling, they tweaked their missile systems, and they came back out of it, and their ratio really didn't change a whole lot. <laughs> Whereas Top Gun had a major impact on the ratio, kill ratio that the Navy fighter pilots were experiencing. Yeah. I made a comment in one of my articles that the North Vietnamese quickly figured out to avoid the white F-4s and go after the drab olive ones. I can't remember where I got that, but did you have any evidence of that in your research? I read that on a couple of <laughs> occasions. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did read that. You know, there were a lot of differences between how the Air Force F-4s were employed and how the Navy F-4s were employed. There was a mm -hmm. difference in the aircraft that they fought. There was a difference in their rules of engagement, the oh, yeah. control uh, from either the Red Crown for the Navy or the various controllers that the Air Force had, you know, and then the Air Force had T-ball and some other things that they had that allowed them to identify friend or foe at distances that the Navy really wasn't able to do. So that let them use sparrows when the Navy was still using sidewinders. So there was a lot of different mixes. But I think in the end, it really shows that you know, Dan Pedersen said to me, you know, we really established that. Uh, of course, it was appropriate for his era. It's the man in the machine. Mm -hmm. Now, we'd say it's the person in the machine. And I think Top Gun really established that when it was founded. And I think the results that you saw in 72 were a testimony to that, particularly when you looked at the Air Force's approach to making it more of a systematic approach rather than yeah. a, a person approach. We've mentioned Dan Pedersen a couple of times. We should maybe point out call sign Yank was... Do we call him the first commanding officer? I mean, he was the guy given the ultimate responsibility to stand it up. So I don't know if we just call him an OIC, but he was kind of the godfather in a sense, right? Yes, he was the first officer in charge. They refer to him as the skipper. Okay. There's a little story in the book about who really was the first commanding officer. There's a lot of, kind of like asking a lawyer a legal question and we answer <laughs> depends. Right. So I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Dan certainly was the gentleman who was tasked with forming the school with overseeing the initial instructors, and he was designated uh, as a lieutenant commander, as officer in charge. Okay. So definitely a great deal of credit. You know, it's funny. Uh, I read Scream of Eagles in another book on Top Gun, and they had talked about Dan Pedersen having this John Wayne persona. And when I met him in person the first time, I thought, they were right. <laughs> he really did. He really did have uh, that personality. And according to the fellow instructors, from that time frame, he really had the ability to marshal their individual greatness that I think even some of them weren't really sure that they even had. And I think he brought out the best in that group. And it still persists, as we've said. All right. So I want to return, though, to this idea that the Brits were somehow involved in it. And I'm not looking to impugn their honor or anything else, but sometimes if you misunderstand, you might think it was maybe either their idea or they were foundational to it. But what was the Brit involvement in the formation of what we know as Top Gun? That was a controversy that I came upon 
in the writing. Dan Pedersen had shared some conversations with me that he had with some of the British people who were trying to uh, take credit for founding Top Gun. And if you go back to 1968, 67, there were British F-4 pilots who were going through the training command, VF-121 in Miramar, and some of them were serving a role as an instructor in VF-121. Some of those instructors were in the tactics phase where all of the Top Gun instructors came from. The British had a role in working on the tactical manual or the flight manual at the training command, VF-121. That was drawn upon some when they put together the tactical manual that Top Gun adopted and put forth as the Navy tactical manual through its school. But the British did not have any central role in the founding of the school. It was the four pilots and the four Rios and the intelligence officer. I mean, there were 10 of them total with Dan Pedersen in there as well. They were the founders. They were the guys that got this off the ground, that did all the initial work, the initial planning, put it together. The British, you got to remember, did not have the security clearances, for one thing, to be able to access the same material or even teach the same material that the Navy pilots who were in Rios did. So that alone was a distinguishment. But there was a point in mid-69 where some of the British pilots and their NFO equivalents, I think they're flight officers, but some of their instructors from 121 offered lectures or maybe did some of the adversary flying with the Top Gun instructors. Because you remember, when Top Gun was created, it was a department. And all of the initial instructors, Dan Pedersen and the whole crew, they all had parallel obligations in mm-hmm. 121, in addition to creating, teaching, running, flying Top Gun. So they were doing double duty. They would borrow people from the RAG to serve as certain roles with them. And some of those people they borrowed were British pilots and the NFO equivalents who would maybe lecture on this or lecture on that things that did not get into the confidentiality, but they weren't instructors per se. I think that's a big distinguishment. And so, you know, I know there was a time when the British were putting that forward. I think they backed off when Dan Pedersen and a few of the other founders came back and said, no, for all of these reasons, that's not true. I think now we're at a point where they've kind of backed down on that claim, but it was a big claim for a period of time. And I'd heard it come up, so I just didn't know the background. And I figured with your research, clearly you do. All right, Brad. So let's start talking through the decades, which is, again, is how the book is oriented. And you've interviewed folks from all of them. Now, in a second, when we get to the 80s, for example, I might ask about the F-16N or the movie, of course. In the 90s, we might talk about the move to Fallon and 2000s. I was there for a lot of that. As far as the 70s go, I mean, I was a young kid running around. When you think of the 70s and Top Gun, what do you think of? And I don't really know what the issues were, but I would be willing to bet that some of it was getting that credibility that you talked about before. It sounds like the validation came fairly early, but as we hinted at, that didn't mean they had unlimited resources or airplanes or ranges or anything else. So talk me through the 70s and what were some of the big issues and maybe even some of the big accomplishments. When I organized a book, like you said, I tried to do every decade by a chapter. I tried to give each decade a theme. And the theme that I gave to the 70s, once we got through the validation part, was really that the school was expanding its role. If you look at the accomplishments that the school achieved during that decade, they were all building on the legacy that the founders and the second generation instructors had put together. There was obviously a physical aspect of it. They were finally successful in 72 of establishing Top Gun as its own command. And the importance of that is significant because that meant that they were able to obtain orders for officers to come to Top Gun. They didn't have to borrow other people's instructors. Right. No more were they sharing instructors with 121. They got orders to Top Gun for a designated period of time, which ended up being roughly three years. Top Gun then had a budget. It could put in a request for its own aircraft, and it did. And it ended up building up a stable by roughly mid to late 73 of about seven A4s, and it would borrow some from other places as needed. But it had its own aircraft, and it had its own career path. And I think that was really important for the school to show that, hey, we're here, and we have our own agency going. And it was really a big step for them. 
They had many battles throughout the 70s to continue to obtain aircraft. They outgrew the trailer fairly quickly. They moved into a larger building in Hangar 2, and then later in the 70s, moved into Hangar 1, even bigger. There was a reason for that we'll get to in a minute. But one of the ways that Top Gun started to expand its mission and its role was to reach out to the fleet to offer more services. They clearly had the Top Gun course, which is what it was called then. But they also started roughly 69 and trying to provide kind of an adversary refresher to the squadrons just before deployment, where the Top Gun instructors would come in, the Top Gun crews that were in the squadron would do the briefings, and then they'd fly adversary for a period of time before the squadron would then deploy to kind of give them a refresher on a squadron basis. So they started that. They reached out to the Marines. They started bringing in more Marine students, The Marines were a huge supporter of Top Gun in the early days. And according to some of the uh, instructors, they write, the Marines were always telling us, if you don't have enough students, call us, we'll find some and send them to you. Let us know. (laughs) There was an event in 1973 that was kind of the trigger event for Top Gun bringing in Marine instructors. That was as a result of the Yom Kippur War in Israel when the Navy commandeered six Top Gun 7A4s and left the school without any aircraft, really, right in the middle of a class. And so there was the quest by the then commanding officer, Muggs McEwen, to obtain new aircraft. They had to teach. And so not only was he able to go out and get some old Air Force discarded T-38s, which then became one of the primary aircraft for the school for the rest of that decade, but he made a deal with the Marines to obtain some additional surplus A-4s in exchange for a quota of Marine students per class and two instructors on the staff. And that's what started the Marine Corps staffing at Top Gun on the instructor, Padre. (laughs) And so that was a big deal that happened. But there were two other things that the school did that really, I think, recognized its role as, hey, we are kind of the body to develop tactics and to disseminate those. And one of those was in 72 when they started bringing in the air intercept controllers. And they expanded the class from not just F-4 pilots and Rios to include the air controllers. And at that time, they were coming from the ships. The people that were in Red Crown, running Red Crown, Larry Noel was one of them. You know, it started out was really kind of a crude system. The AICs would come. They listened to what the fighters were being taught. They learned the fighter tactics, the fighter lingo, how you would run an intercept from the fighter's perspective. It wasn't until the mid-80s when that was expanded to where The AICs then started to get involved and let the students know, hey, this is what we do and why we do it. And it really created that dialogue that we have today. So they expanded the school student cadre to include AICs. In 75, they brought in adversary. One of the things that Top Gun would do in the early 70s is they would provide adversary aircraft to opportunities for the fleet squadrons. And it was in addition to, you know, what we talked about earlier about the squadrons that were about to deploy. It was for other squadrons that wanted to do things with adversary as well. Well, they quickly realized that they just didn't have the manpower. So they thought, well, the Navy had created some standalone adversary squadrons. And Top Gun was starting to notice that these squadrons were kind of going off on their own on how they were teaching. There was no real standardization in the instructional methods. Sometimes they were getting dangerous. Sometimes the adversary squadrons were returning to the old attitude of, well, hey, I know a lot. You've got to beat me. You'll learn from me rather than I'm here to teach you to be me and to beat me. And so Top Gun in 75 brought in the adversary instructor role, and they made that part of the course. They had an independent course for a while, and then they kind of rolled it into the Top Gun class. So that was a really big deal to bring in the instruction, standardization of the adversary to the school. So those were two of the really big things that they did. So earlier in the talk, I mentioned that Top Gun had moved from the trailer into Hangar 2. In 1970, at some point, about halfway through the year, it moved from the original two-room trailer into uh, some of the classrooms that were open in Hangar 2. And that's where Top Gun established its office. Some of the photographs that you'll see in my book will show an A-4 Skyhawk or an F-5 Tiger II sitting outside of a Hangar 2. And that's where they operated until 1977 when they moved into Hangar 1. The need for the additional space to accommodate the top scope program 
is the driving factor, plus the fact that the Top Gun staff was just getting very large at that point. So they needed additional space, and that uh, necessitated the move in 1977. They stayed in that facility until roughly 1987 when they moved into a different portion of the Hangar 1, where they stayed until 1992 when they moved into the new specially built building at Miramar. And unfortunately, despite the fact that that was just an absolutely gorgeous building and perfectly suited for them, they were only in it about three and a half years before they moved to Fallon. So that's kind of the story of the Top Gun uh, physical growth and the buildings. Top Gun started doing foreign visits to our allies. They'd send a couple instructors to various NATO allies in Europe to do a mini Top Gun course at a classification level that was comfortable to the government. And they would go over and lecture on certain topics and fly and help pass on that information. So that started. We started to see foreign students attend. There were a few, actually. Hmm. There was a Brit that came over in the early 70s. There were a couple Israeli pilots that attended Top Gun in the early 70s. And to me, the thing uh, I thought was a really interesting program of the 70s as a part of this evolution of its role and mission was recognition in the mid-70s that now that we've got the new Tomcat, the F-14, with its phenomenal fighter capabilities, it also has a air intercept capability. It's got the outstanding radar. It's got the outstanding missile, the Phoenix. Mm-hmm. We need to start looking at that so that we can help train these crews to be able to be a complete fighter crew. Not only the ACM part, the air combat maneuvering, but the outer air battle, the fleet defense. All right defense against the Soviet bombers with the uh, anti-ship missiles. And so they started in 76, a program that became called Top Scope. And it was an actual separate class Hmm. that ran from 76 to 80. And this is something that I was wholly unaware of when I started the book. (laughs) It was really up my alley because I think if I would have could go back in time and be a F-14 crew member, I would want to be in the back seat. That would be my choice. So they kind of appealed to me. (laughs) <laughs> but it was a neat program that they started, and it lasted until 80 when they rolled it into the actual Top Gun, by then, power projection class. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the 80s, about what happened to that. But it became a little overwhelming. So in 1981, the school broke it out into two parts. They sent a portion of it, the more basic aspects of the outer air battle training, back to the Tomcat fleet replenishment squadrons at Miramar and Oceana. And then they took the advanced aspects of it. They kept a little bit in the Top Gun power projection course, and the bulk was placed into a program called the Fleet Air Superiority Training. And it was kind of a traveling roadshow that would go out with a group of Top Gun instructors, largely Rios, and they would visit the bases and give lectures, not just to an individual crew or a group of students, but to an entire F-14 squadron, basically the two Tomcat squadrons in the air wing, along with the E-2 Hawkeye squadron. And they would work those topics into a week-long presentation of lectures and some simulators. And then they do some flying with them as well. It was a big deal. It was part of expanding the Top Gun mission. How can we help the fleet be better at its job? So that was a very interesting program that Top Gun had pursued. And that's how it ultimately came to resolution. The FAST program lasted until roughly 1994. It was largely phased out because of the end of the Cold War and the end of that mission. And then there's a whole other aspect, and really I'll just touch upon it real briefly. Top Gun has always been aware of the need to stay ahead of tactics. You know, the first year or two of the school, it was, we really got to get everybody up to speed on what the tactics are. In late 1971, early 72, they had what was called the unofficial name, Malibu Conference, where several of the instructors were coming back from a fighter symposium. They stopped in Malibu. They went to a restaurant. And they started talking a little bit about what are we teaching at the school? Are our people that are coming through ready for something more advanced? And so they changed the focus of the tactics to be more aggressive so that when the air crews went into the 72 linebacker time frame, They were being trained in that second phase of tactics, not just how to defend yourself, how to handle yourself, what to do in a basic sense, but how to be more aggressive and take the offensive for either of the two pilots in the loose deuce formation. I think that was really a significant event. But then it continued with top scope 
dealing with the outer air battle. There was a uh, missile study in the late 70s, AIMVAL, ACEVAL, where they studied the F-14 and Mm F-15 flying against a lesser generation aircraft armed with an all-aspect heat-seeking missile. The results of that were then briefed upon and brought into Top Gun. There were new threats developing with the MiG-23, with the forward quarter missile threat that had not existed before. Top Gun was ahead of that. They brought that into the school as new tactics. The Israelis brought in the notion of one v. many. So in 1975, Top Gun then incorporated into its curriculum not just one versus one, one versus two, but how do you fight in a one versus many? scenario, which we might see in Europe at that time, NATO and Warsaw Pact had got into a tassel. So they were always looking down the road at the next war, and they were trying to make sure they were not going to fight the next war with the tactics of the last one. And the 70s were a great example of the school really putting that notion into play and staying ahead of the game. You know what? Brad and I are having such a good time that we go on for well over another hour. So instead of just one long Joe Rogan style interview, let's knock it off for this week. But don't worry, we'll pick it up in just five short days for part two of Top Gun The Legacy. Stay tuned.